So the second survey is about the um, Shared Nothing by Mike Stonebreaker. I'm not sure if I need to introduce Mike. He started so many things. Ingress, Postgres, Illustra, Cohera, CIDB, Streambase, P4. I don't know if I should continue. Mike. <laughs> OK, so, so I'm going to give you my opinion. <laughs> and, 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 that, and that will hopefully generate some discussion. So the, uh, I was asked to, to survey shared nothing versus shared disk. So shared nothing uh, are, you know, as a computer architecture means you've got uh, a bunch of disks, a bunch of, a bunch of nodes connected by networking, and disks are not shared among nodes. Uh, the general idea is that uh, you're running, to put some context, you're running Linux on each of these nodes. And there's a Linux file system on each of these, uh, on the disks that are attached to each node. And you're running K independent file systems and you're running K independent versions of Linux. How do I do advance here? Oh. Uh, so. The proponents of shared nothing say line up jelly beans. These are every node with its associated memory and disk is a jelly bean. They're very cheap. Uh, if you look at any of the large uh, web providers, they're all running this sort of architecture. Uh, they're t connected together typically by TCP IP, but it could be something else uh, if you want to go faster. And who is it that's peddling this architecture? All parallel database systems, essentially all parallel database systems, Teradata was mentioned, CIDB were mentioned, they're all running this architecture. So this is essentially uh, what all commercial database systems that run parallel uh, are advocating. So this is architecture A, so, and the people who like it. And uh, it has the following features, which are, are the things that are important. So you've got a big thing called data, and you've got a small thing called query. This says, if you have a query, send it to the node that has the data, or whatever nodes have the data. So you send the small thing to the big thing. So send the query to the data, and do queries in parallel. So uh, if you want to find uh, all, all the people who have uh, A, B, or C, you figure out which disks have the data that you might need. You send the query to all the nodes that have those disks, and you execute it in parallel. So high degree of parallelism. By the way, I'm saying nothing new. Teradata was instrumental in doing this uh, 20 years ago, and everybody else has just copied what Teradata did a long time ago. Where this gets interesting in your world is essentially all of these guys either have or soon will have the ability to have user-defined functions. So if you're doing compute, the way that the database guys would say do com com compute is put the computation into a user-defined function and run it inside the database system, at which point uh, they're executed in parallel. So the Novartis speaker was talking about CIDB execution of statistics. That's all done in parallel across all the nodes inside user-defined functions. All the nodes are equal. Line up as many as you need. They're easy to manage. They're all the same. So this is characteristics of doing shared nothing. On the other hand, total stop reset. There's another architecture that you could use, which is all the nodes uh, are interconnected with all the disks, so that if you're running on a specific node, you can get at any data anywhere. So this has commonly been, ca been called shared disk. And why do I bring this up? Uh, basically, what it, what, where it came from was Sun and HP back in the early 90s you know, had server architectures that looked like this. So they were multi-porting their disk system so that a collection of servers could talk to their disks. So uh, this is where it came from. And uh, what 
happened is that the modern day version of that is if you work for a storage area network company such as EMC or Hitachi, you are peddling this architecture like mad except the physical, it's not, uh, it's not physical, the bottom picture is your SAN. And so if you're running in a SAN world, you're running shared disk. Why do I talk about this? Because it's seemingly what is peddled by the high performance computing community. So I see a bunch of HPC architectures and I'm being a little bit pejorative, but this is what they look like to a database guy. So on the left hand side, you've got this flops farm. And so you've got compute. And compute is networking connected to high speed nodes with high speed interconnect. There may well be local scratch disks, but there's no data storage. So the left hand side is compute. Uh, seemingly as an afterthought, there's this gluon on the right hand side called storage. And this is a file system, basically a file server and all permanent storage is on the right hand side. All compute is on the left hand side. And this is what HPC looks like. As often as not, there's two different networks, one to get at uh, file storage, one to do interchange among, among compute servers. So HPC pretty much looks like this. It is shared disk because the whole idea is that if you're running on any one of these compute servers, you can do a file read and it goes over to the file system and any compute node can read any, any data. So queries, how do queries work in this sort of world? Well, the whole idea is you're, this is a file system oriented world. So basically, uh, you run a query, the query runs on one of these compute servers and does file I.O. So data is sucked over to the compute system. And so what happens is that you're sending the data to the query, not the other way around. So you're sending the big thing to the small thing, which to a database guy makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, compute uh, is on the left hand side. It's completely disconnected from data storage, which is somewhere else. So uh, parallelism of your compute is up to you. Parallelism of data access is also up to you. So if you have a file system program and you decide to run it on four nodes, it's up to you to figure out how to do parallelism and how to do the file reads to make this all work. So parallelism becomes user controlled. And one of the big problems HPC guys have is how many compute servers and how many data servers, because you've got two very different things that are doing very different functions. So the high level bit, as near as I can tell, is are, are you worried about flops? Are you basically worried about CPU? And assuming that you're CPU bound, because if you're, the previous discussion on train scheduling was all about IOPS. And the HPC guys, you know, seem to be not in that world. So are you compute centric uh, and, and assuming that you're CPU bound? And so the high pole in the tent is flops. Or are you data centric and assume that the high pole in the tent is IOPS? Uh, if you're in the top bucket, the current HPC architectures are exactly what you want. If you're in the bottom bucket, uh, that's an anathema. You certainly do not want to do what the current HPC systems are suggesting. So my prediction, and you can all say this is wishful thinking, uh, and so I'm perfectly happy to have everybody throw watermelons at me, seems to me that the Novartis guys are going in the right direction, which is I can't imagine storing 100 petabytes of genomic data in a file system system. That just is unimaginable to me. And so my prediction is that over time, high-end science will move to database systems just because 100 petabytes is just completely unmanageable otherwise. 
So if you don't want to drown in big data, you're going to have to move to a database system, and database systems are going to have to get better at this sort of data. And I see uh, science guys all the time engaging in what I consider terrible hygiene, which is they encode metadata into file names. You know, like a file name is date, location, sensor number. This is all metadata that you want to be able to access, and encoding it in a file name is unimaginable to a, a database guy. So uh, I think this community is going to move to database systems. They have to, because otherwise you're really going to drown. And of course, small, low-end science will do the same thing that high-end science does. Uh, so I think the science world has to move to database systems. Uh, and so I'm making that prediction that, that it may take two decades, but it's, it's going to happen. Uh, I was amused at the first genomics talk which sort of reinvents a, da a specialized database system for genomics with all kinds of stuff like compression, which is built into current parallel database systems. So current parallel database systems probably don't work quite right, but we're all, we're all going to have to move in that direction, and, and you are going to run uh, database systems sooner or later. If that happens, database systems the thing you run is going to be shared nothing, because that's what all of the database guys are doing, because they're all about move the small thing to the big thing, not vice versa. So the database system you choose will be shared nothing. Now, if you get there, the obvious next thing is the user-defined functions that are inside whatever that parallel database system is, you are going to use them because they are going to go faster than putting them outside the database system. So over time, you will move all of your codes into user-defined functions. And so that's going to put them inside the database system and you're going to put a single thing, uh, you know, monitoring usage. and. By the way, UDFs are way more shareable than if they're in files in some random file system. So all of this uh, could happen, which is equivalent to saying shared nothing is going to win. It's guaranteed if you take, if, if what I just said happens, shared nothing will win. And most HPC architectures are completely incompatible with this. The last thing Teradata wants is to have to run on your favorite HPC system. So maybe all the money that's currently being spent on HPC can be liberated to some better use. So th this is the database view of the world. So uh, I'm sure that there is someone who will take the opposite point of view. I think we should send Mike for an HP to an HPC conference. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, so in your classification, where do you put the shared storage system like GFS or HDFS? Is it a shared disk system or is it so a H shared? HDFS is a file system. It's not a database system. So as Terry, I would be happy to liberate all that money that you're talking about. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that there is, in, in the way that you characterize the shared nothing, one fundamental thing that the shared nothing architectures have to do to be successful in this, in this vision. And that is that for a very large scale, you can't assume that all of the hardware nodes are the same. Because if I make an investment this year, and I want to add more stuff next year, I can't assume sure. that the nodes are of the same generation of the technology. So, so the shared nothing in the database really has to be virtualized and separated from the physical hardware to truly be successful, right? Sure. And this is already, yeah. yeah. Can, we get, can we get some people who are going to defend shared disk? Because that's, that's what I'd really like to hear. Oh, wow, OK. <laughs> the black one, black mic? Oh. So the one thing that's missing from this conversation is that a lot of HPC is bottlenecked by the ability of nodes to talk to each other. So if you're talking something like CFD, 
then that's just not doable as a UDF against a database. And you have meshes that live across a thousand nodes where the primary bottleneck is not CPU or disk I.O. It's the ability of one node to send its boundary conditions across to the other ones. And so for those HPC applications, none of this really is relevant. Okay, and I think so, that a lot of the budgets so, for HPC okay, are being so, driven by CFD and other similar so, applications. So I should have said the following. If, if you run a PsyDB user-defined function, then inside, then you get K instantiations of that function, and they can shuffle data back and forth over whatever high-speed interconnect you've got. The, the actual algorithm you're running inside the database engine is essentially the same algorithm you would run out in user code. And so it will run just as fast. And it will be either network bound or not network bound, CPU bound or not CPU bound, I.O. bound or not I.O. bound, depending on whatever the heck you're doing and whatever all of the parameters of the hardware are. So I don't, the, you know, you've got to have UDFs that can do shuffle and be multi-step and do shuffles in between. And, you know, there aren't very many UDF systems that do that right now, but PsyDB does and others will have to do it because you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, single-step UDFs that can't communicate among themselves won't do any of the codes that you guys want to do. Um, I'm kind of a database person in an HPC uh, shop, so I'm trying to find out, is, do you have a, a transition plan other than UDF? How do you transfer petabytes of uh, file data into a database system? Okay, so, so that's a great question, which is if you're currently if you currently have 100 petabytes of file data, how are you going to morph from over here to over there? Uh, the, the, uh, let, let me give you a dumb answer to that question. Uh, every three years, it seems like there's a new HP, you know, the, any, any of the HPC centers get totally new hardware every three years. So you've got to morph from wherever you are to the next version. So those, these are obvious uh, breakpoints at which to change the technology. I mean, I guess the simple answer is that the HPC community has been foisted with the following problem, which is rewrite all your codes for the next HPC architecture every three years. And Science guys are accustomed to doing that, so you're going to have an ugly transition, and you, you get them now every three years anyway. Yeah, um, so I'm a database guy living in a Hadoop world at Facebook, and um, I guess I've learned two things um, from that, which is I used to think the way pretty much you do, Mike, and I, I learned that Hadoop with all its inefficiencies and everything else, gives you two things. So it's not just HDFS as the shared file system, but because of the fact that the MapReduce part has locality awareness, both rack locality and node locality, you're getting a lot of the sending the data down, I mean, sending the queries down to the data. And the other thing is replication factor, the fact that you have a lot more flexibility about how you spread out which data needs to get accessed by a lot more nodes at once, so you can actually sustain that load. And you get a lot more dynamic uh, query handling that way. So, so uh, great, great comment, which is let's, let's talk about Hadoop slash MapReduce. So to make, that, to, make that, to make that run fast, you've got to manage to send the query to the data, which is you've got to, you get an, an ugly scheduling problem to try and, fig, to try and avoid you know, moving you know, huge amounts of data over the network. That comes for free in a parallel database system. Uh, number two, there's a great talk yesterday by the eBay guys. Uh, they compared Teradata to Hadoop, and Teradata was an order of magnitude faster. I've yet to see any application that didn't run an order of magnitude or more faster on a parallel database system than on Hadoop. So you, you can put 1,000 Hadoop nodes and 100 database nodes, and they'll run about the same. I'd rather have the 100 database nodes because if you're running 1,000, you've got to worry a lot more about failures than I do because you've got a lot more nodes. So, so I think Hadoop can grow up to be a real database system. 
and you could put in index, I mean, you could turn it into a parallel database system uh, by adding a query executor, adding indexing, adding updates, adding transactions, adding a whole database system to Hadoop. And to I, to I think, you totally know, agree. I can't quite understand. You've got a, an army of people working on Hadoop with an obvious way, way to go. Why are you not making better progress? <laughs> totally agree. I think it's a matter of inefficiency. Uh, don't, don't you think that you need both? Because when you have a lot of shared NAS and nodes, it's me. When you have a lot of shared NAS and nodes, you need to find them, and you need a shared disk uh, database to find them. I, I don't follow you. When you have many shared NAS and nodes, no. You need to find where data is located. And to find it, you need a shared disk database. No. You, I mean, every parallel database system keeps track of how the data is partitioned over however many nodes you've got. And, you know, parallel database systems, the large instantiations are running several hundred nodes, and they're keeping track of where everything is. But and, they, and they all run replications, so you can have, if you fail, they fail over, they do everything that Hadoop does. I mean. This is all kept track of without you having to do anything. But your basic registry, your basic registry which keeps uh, location of your data, it's a shared disk database on its own. No, no, it's replicated. It's a replicated shared nothing database. The, you know, in in these shared nothing databases, at least I know how most of them work. There is no shared disk data anywhere. I didn't tell a lie, did I? You may have shared physical disk, but there's no shared data. Right. So, uh, all right, so there's some comments coming from the HPCI who deals with um, one of the very extreme five data. Is the mic right. on? Is the microphone on? Okay, better? Okay, so I come from Oak Ridge Lab, and we have um, some HPC machines. And what I don't understand, I mean, some of the things you said are not exactly accurate for HPC, like shared file systems. It's very few um, from the large um, HPC centers where we have them. In fact, they wreak havoc, yet lots of people like them. But what I don't understand is I have right now 250,000 cores all writing together when I have one app onto a file system and I don't understand how a database system can handle that when we're changing our output fairly frequently. In fact, what's there, no schema really is set. So how do you do that when you have maybe, I don't know, I mean, what system can do this for a cheap amount of money for writing, say, 10 petabytes a day on one, from one computer. Okay, so, so you made a whole bunch of, of, of comments. All I'm arguing is that if you have 250,000 cores, so, so let's say that's on, on 10,000 nodes. I mean, how many nodes do you have? 35,000. 35, so if you're running 35,000 nodes, all I'm arguing is that you want to simply run uh, 35,000 disk systems with local disk and, that, and have a database system that's managing, you know, all of this distributed data. And if the data, if the database, you know, if you do an update, you know, in SQL that is spread across 35,000 nodes, it will all do updates to the local, local data where you economize bandwidth so you don't die on your network because everybody is writing locally rather than remotely. And that's just a, a much better way to organize I.O. than trying to have, you know, 250,000 cores all, all sending the fire hose to you and, and having you attempt to write it. I mean, that's why, that's why parallel database systems work the way they do. 
And, and the rest of your comment was current parallel database systems don't meet your needs. And I agree with that. And I think we, you know, there has to be a new, a new collection of data management systems that work better on science data. And so that, that much I totally agree with. And so I hope you know, SciDB and other things will do better over time because the previous generation of parallel database systems have been, have been meant for business data processing, which doesn't work for your kind of stuff. Go ahead. So do we get to have lunch at some point here? <laughs> <laughs> you know, people like this conversation, I think, so. <laughs> So in some sense, the ultimate shared nothing is everybody's desktop or laptop computer and so forth spread around. Do, Absolute, you, do you see a point at which SciDB or some other system could be basically running on everybody's computer and doing its own little bit? You know, I, you know one of the previous speakers said, boy, I, I, need, I need all this genomic sequencing. Was it you? <laughs> And, and I said, you know, there, there was a search for extraterrestrial life done, done a, a few years ago, SETI, I think it was. And they simply went out and got people's laptops when they weren't using them and started computing on them. No communication, no data needed, no Right, so, so, well, some data needed, not much. And, and so I think, I think to the extent that there are problems that can be widely distributed on very cheap hardware, you know, that's, that's the cheapest hardware around. So maybe one last comment question, because we do need to switch to launch. The, the yellow microphone? Okay, yeah, I just have a comment on the uh, shared uh, nothing versus the shared disk. Uh, so to me, I, I don't think it's uh, either an or question, right? I guess the key thing here is to uh, provide a platform that's uh, highly parallelized uh, highly scalable in multiple dimensions in terms of not only the, the I.O., but also the computing power, also the number of users that you can support. And also be able to handle, you know, mixed workloads, right, different workloads. I guess the shared uh, nothing architecture has a lot of merits, but on the other hand, it does have some drawbacks in my mind, right? One thing is that uh, you have to pre-partition your data equally across your nodes in order for you to achieve the best uh, parallel efficiency, right? Uh, and that way, it kind of, it kind of limits the, 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 the issue where, you know, if you don't know the, 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 the queries, you know, data accessing pattern beforehand, you might, you know, yeah. suffer in so, terms of your parallel efficiency. So, so you're, you're making a really good point, which is all of the current parallel database systems do not reprovision on the fly, which is you're currently running on 50 nodes, you want to start running on 70 nodes, and you want it to just you want to just add 20 more IP addresses and have the database system repartition everything without ever going down. There's nothing impossible about doing that. Current systems just don't do it, and they don't correct data skew on the fly either, which was your, the point right. you were making. And I think I can't understand why you guys as users don't make Teradata do that because you know. <laughs> Because all these systems should do it, and it just is a fair amount of work, and you just have to push. Well, them I guess to do it, it comes with a price, right? I guess there are solutions you can do that. One is you, you can have data redundancy across your nodes, right? The second is you, you can have a high-speed interconnect, right, across the nodes, so you can shuffle the data back and forth. But it comes with a price. Uh, also, you're gonna, it's going to create the bottlenecks as well. The other comment I want to make with on the shared nothing architecture is how I mean, it will be it's somewhat difficult for you to handle elasticity, you know, elastic computing. How you can shrink a 